Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our participants from around the world. My name is Ria Ligari, Community Practice and I'm very glad to welcome you all to this virtual dialogue webinar on the Sustainable Development Goals and Training for Gender Equality. So we're very lucky to have with us today a large audience and four expert panelists. And uh, before we begin, I am going to show you an outline of today's webinar. Um, Uh, Sabrina, can we click on through the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so as you can see on your screens, we're going to start with just speaking about logistics, and then I'll introduce our topic for today, which is the SDGs and training for gender equality, and then we'll go on to our panelists' presentations, and then we'll have time at the end for our audience members to ask questions. So. Uh, <clears throat> that brings me on to the logistics. So please, you can send in your questions at any time using the questions tab at the bottom right hand corner of the GoToWebinar toolbar. And uh, whenever, our, as long as our presenters are speaking, you can send in these questions. And uh, I'll pose these questions to the speakers after their presentations. And I should also mention that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the UN Women Training Center's YouTube channel. So I'm very uh, happy to introduce our panelists today. We have four experts with us, Sophie Brown of the UN Women Policy Division, Ranjani Krishnamurthy of Vistar Consulting in India, Dr. Ellen Morris of the Energy and Environment Faculty of Columbia University, and Dr. Sue Cavill, an international expert on water sanitation and hygiene. And I'll introduce each panelist in slightly more detail before they begin their presentations, and I'd like to thank them all for joining us today. So uh, before we begin, or let's begin, by uh, speaking a little bit about what virtual dialogues are. So if we go to the next slide, we can see that um, at the UN Women Training Center, we believe in creating knowledge and sharing learning in a participatory manner. And that's really our drive behind the, our virtual dialogues. So these are mechanisms for us as training practitioners to continually discuss, exchange, and share knowledge and nurture a community for collective learning across the world. Um, they're part webinar and part forum discussion. So I hope you'll all be able to join the debates on our COP platform, which is uh, you can access through the Training Center's uh, e-learning portal. And I'll explain a little bit about how to access the forum at the end of the webinar. And uh, I should say that this is the second virtual dialogue that we have organized this year um, by the community of community of practice of the training center. And the COP is an open platform for dialogue and knowledge sharing for participants from around the world who represent government, civil society, academia, international organizations, and UN agencies. And so we're all here today to discuss our topic. Uh, so if we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, today we're here to discuss the sustainable development goals in relation to training for gender equality. So as we know, Gender equality is the focus of one of the standalone goals, SDG 5, but it's also a cross-cutting part of all 17 global goals. And as we also know, to achieve gender equality, we need policies and accountability processes that are gender responsive. And training for gender equality is really one of the most powerful tools we have to make these policies and processes more gender responsive. Our discussions today are very timely because they come right in the wake of UN Women's recent launch of its flagship global monitoring report on gender and the SDGs called Turning Promises to, into Action, which our speaker Sophie is going to tell us all about. And the Training Center has also just released a new self-paced training course on the 2030 Agenda and Gender Equality. And we hope that many of you will be able to sign up for this course today or whenever you can. And uh, so in this context, if we go into the next slide, we can see the objectives that we have for our session today. And uh, we think it's a good moment for us to ask, why is training for gender equality well-placed to support the SDGs? And how can training for gender equality support our efforts to achieve the SDGs? And to reflect on these broad questions, we're now going to turn to our panelists' presentations. And please remember to use the questions tab to send in your questions at any time today. Um, so first we have with us Sophie Brown. We're very delighted to welcome Sophie. And uh, Sophie, is is a researcher, policy analyst, and focal point for the SDGs at UN Women. 
And uh, as the coordinator of the UN Women's Global SDG Monitoring Report, she plays a leading role in ensuring that the 2030 Agenda is implemented and monitored in a gender responsive manner globally. So before joining UN Women, uh, Sophie worked with international and community-based NGOs on issues ranging from gender equality to intersectional discrimination, disability, indigenous and LGTB rights, and violence against women. So Sophie, I'm very happy for you to take the floor and uh, you just let us know when you want us to click through your slides. So over to you, Sophie. Sure, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. So I'll, I'll, I'll jump straight into uh, talking about the report. Um, so the, the report broadly highlights key global trends for women and girls affecting progress across all SDGs and provides practical ways to implement gender responsive policies and accountability processes. I'll not focus on too much of the latter today as I want to focus more broadly on making the case for why and how gender equality should be viewed as central to the 2030 agenda. And also I'll focus on the need for better data. I'll then emphasize how powerful training can be as a tool in this endeavor by briefly presenting on how we treat capacity development as central to improving data collection and analysis for SDG monitoring. Uh, you can go to the next slide, thanks. So overall, we view the agenda as an unprecedented yet ambitious opportunity to challenge trends of deepening inequalities within and across countries, underpinned by the principle of leave no one behind. The report is the first of its kind to inter interrogate the agenda's commitment to gender equality as cross-cutting and comprehensive. So we look at gender equality across all 17 SDGs, showing that in many areas, progress is too slow to achieve the targets by 2030. We conduct in-depth data analysis for four countries to reveal which groups of women and girls are being systematically left behind. And we provide concrete recommendations for accelerating progress. Next slide, please. The report details the status of women and girls under SDG 5, the goal dedicated to gender equality. It also shows how gender inequalities remain pervasive across all the other 16 goals and advocates for integrated approaches to progressing the framework. To give you a taste of its findings, I'll provide some quick examples, but I encourage you all to check out the report on our website in more detail and um, hopefully learn more through uh, undertaking the new training course as well. Next slide, please. So we used new data to examine SDG 1 on poverty and substantiated what we have long expected that women are more affected by poverty than men globally. To be exact, and you can see it on the slide here, women are about four percentage points more likely to, to live in extreme poverty. Further disaggregation reveals an even more unsettling finding that across all regions, the gender gap in extreme poverty widened significantly among people who are between 25 and 34 years old, which you can see um, there in the graph. These are peak productive years where many women and men are earning a living to sustain themselves and their families. There are also prime reproductive years where many have small children to support and care for. The fact that for this particular age group, women are so much more likely to be poor shows that the responsibility for reconciling production and reproduction falls disproportionately on women's shoulders. And for many women, this implies harsh trade-offs, either leaving their children unattended or sacrificing an income that could lift them and their children out of poverty. So the report explores policy recommendations to address this. Next slide, please. Looking quickly at SDG 2 on ending hunger and achieving food security, for example, we use data for 141 countries to show that, and, and, fr and from that we found that women are more likely than men to report food insecurity in nearly two thirds of countries. This includes both developed and developing countries with varying gender gaps. In light of this finding, as we argue in the report, the food price volatilities that we've seen in recent years are particularly concerning. Next slide, please. Looking at one of the many targets under SDG 5, we find that violence against women and girls is rampant across countries, regions and cultures in public and private spaces. 
Globally, 19% or one in five women have experienced physical and or sexual violence by an intimate partner in the past 12 months, which is indicated by the blue bar on the graph on the screen. Without addressing this pandemic, the goal of creating peaceful and inclusive societies, which is also SDG 16, will remain elusive. Nonetheless, the report's dedicated chapter on violence against women indicates significant progress in terms of legislation and provides integrated policy proposals. Next slide, please. Under SDG 6 on clean water and sanitation, the report shows that when safe drinking water is not available on premises, women and girls often have to walk long distances to collect it. They're responsible for water collection in 80% of households without access to water. This work is arduous, needless to say. It takes a toll on health, compromises safety, and takes up time that could otherwise be used for activities such as paid work and education that could improve girls' and women's circumstances. Despite this astounding reality, SDG 6 is essentially gender blind from our assessment, um, which means that it has no official indicator that tracks progress for women and girls. Next slide, thanks. Since official statistics, such as those I just presented, often assess outcomes based on national, regional and global averages, which mask inequalities among social groups and downplay privileges at the top, we unravel the averages to ask who really is being left behind at a local level. We answer this by looking at the micro data of four countries, Colombia, Nigeria, Pakistan and the US. And across countries, we find that women and girls who experience multiple forms of discrimination often fare worse than the average across a range of SDG related indicators. We call this clustered deprivations. Next slide, thanks. In Nigeria, for example, being poor and married at an early age makes women and girls more likely to drop out of school, give birth at an early age, suffer complications during childbirth and experience violence in later life. <clears throat> for the poorer rural women, more than any other in Nigerian society, her chances of moving out of poverty are trampled following such a chain of events. Next slide, thanks. Such compounding inequalities are also common in developed countries like the United States, where race or ethnicity and income are closely interlinked. For example, a Hispanic woman from a low income household is almost 13 times as likely to lack a high school diploma, twice as likely to be out of work and 10 times as likely to lack health insurance as a white woman from a higher income household. Next slide, thanks. So the report shows that gender inequalities remain pervasive across every dimension of sustainable development. And that even when we see change, progress can be fragile, uneven and unequal for women and girls. But we take an optimistic outlook and provide forward looking recommendations, focusing on three elements, transformative policies, better data and greater accountability. Next slide, thanks. To illustrate how we need transformative policies to achieve sustainable change at scale, one of many examples we offer is on essential services. Services that millions of women and girls depend on, like health, water, childcare, shelters, are often, often chronically underfunded or simply unavailable, and often the first to be hit by austerity measures. But we highlight the untapped scope for reallocating or raising resources to avoid cutbacks and instead strengthen services, including roles for public and private sectors. Taking the example of quality childcare services, we demonstrate how investing in their expansion would advance a number of child and gender related targets of the SDGs, as you'll see on the graph, on the screen. Next slide, thanks. We need better data to monitor progress across all SDGs in all countries and over time. We squeezed every data source available for this report, but the challenges for gender sensitive monitoring remain enormous. Currently six out of the 17 SDGs, for example, have no official indicator that tracks progress for women and girls. This means that many goals that affect women and entrench gender inequalities are essentially gender blind, as I mentioned earlier, in regards to SDG 6. This also includes SDG 7 on clean energy, SDG 15 on forestation, among many others. 
Next slide, thanks. Plus, only 23% of the data needed to monitor the gender-specific indicators we have is recent, that is from 2010 or later. And only 16% is available for two or more points in time, which is needed to monitor trends. So if we're serious about tracking progress, we need to ensure that gender data is collected and updated on a regular basis. We must push for investments in national statistical capacities and mainstream gender in their strategies. We must foster collaborations between users and producers to improve quality and effectiveness to meet these increased demands. Next slide. Needless to say, data is critical for making the right decisions and for holding decision makers accountable for gender equality commitments. This requires a revolution in gender data as well as in democratic governance. The report lays out concrete recommendations to achieve this at all levels, which I won't get into um, today. Next slide, thanks. Lastly, to make all this possible, UN Women's Research and Data Section is helping develop capacities across the board to collect and analyse data. Through our Gender Statistics Program, Making Every Woman and Girl Count, we have identified numerous needs in relation to training on gender statistics, namely an overall need for basic training that can target both technical audiences like statisticians to help them better communicate around gender statistics, and to non-technical audiences of civil society organisations and individuals, policy makers, et cetera, on how to interpret or use gender statistics for policy and advocacy purposes. The need for specialised training is also a, a, a need that we have identified, for example, um, in collecting time use and a violence against women survey data. So we're applying various training and collaborative approaches to meet these needs. For example, employing regionally focused statisticians to build country level capacities. Uh, we're collaborating with regional commissions and national statistical offices to develop curriculums, modules and to deliver trainings. We're facilitating peer-to-peer -peer exchanges for data collectors and users, for example, uh, regional NSO coalitions. And uh, we're looking at what existing training courses are out there that we um, think could be utilised more broadly and we're translating those into different languages to disseminate them. Uh, last slide, thanks. So to close, we see our efforts as part of a broader reality check for world leaders um, in the fact that much remains to be done, but we provide a roadmap, a roadmap for all actors to start getting there using gender responsive outcomes, policies and processes. And we hope that with this and with the new training course being launched by our training centre, uh, that we're making a strong case for keeping gender equality front and centre during SDG monitoring and implementation. So with that, thank you for your time and I look forward to a lively discussion and happy to be in touch with people after um, the event today. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sophie. Your presentation was excellent and I think it shed a lot of light on training and how we need gender data and everything about the report. So we're very happy for you to be with us today and please remember our audience members that you can send in questions for Sophie and for all the other presenters at any time using the questions tab. So we're going to turn to our second speaker today. So if we could go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so our second speaker today is Ranjani Krishnamurthy, and Ranjani is a former, former board member of Vistar Consulting, which is, uh, and she's also an independent trainer and researcher on gender and development. She focuses on the SDGs, particularly on SDG 5, and uh, as well as targets and indicators related to youth and children from a gender lens. She is a co-author of an excellent trainer's manual on gender equality and the SDGs and facilitates trainer training programs on these subjects for NGOs, academics and governments, including in India, Nepal and internationally. So Ranjani, I'd ask you to please begin your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sophie. I will pick up from where you left. Uh, firstly, I want to say when we talk about uh, training on gender equality, uh, SDGs and uh, training for gender equality, we firstly need to be clear that we are talking about substantive gender equality. This is a challenge in developing countries um, when we emphasize that women and men have to be treated differently to achieve gender equality. For example, childcare, 
and hours of work, etc. So this is a concept which we need to be clear. And among women, there is we need to treat the most marginalized differently. Their disadvantages are different. For example, in India, it could be caste discrimination and gender discrimination adding together. And, third, and also that gender is beyond binary. I think this is a very big challenge in countries to push them to look at the status of the LGBTIQ and uh, the transgenders uh, are more acceptable to look at than sexual orientation. Um, the third is uh, making governments um, look at uh, the model of development. You know, why MDG is delivered on some targets, but did not deliver on some like nutrition, women in parliament. Uh, so what is it that we did right and what is it we did wrong and what should be the balance between state market and civil society to achieve the SDG? So we need to learn from the history and move forward. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So why training for substantive gender equality is important for SDGs? Like Sophie mentioned, even for the SDGs where there's no target or indicator on gender, for example, like energy or marine resources, um, we need to look, take a substantive gender equality approach because women are fish workers. They have knowledge on marine resources, which if left untapped, that particular goal or target is not going to be achieved apart from empowering women as fish workers. Um, so that is, uh, I'm just took one uh, SDG as an example. And I feel that while the formal gender equality people accept, you know, put in place a legislation, the more substantive gender equality approach, there is a deficit in capacities. Yeah. Um, um, for example, and this also needs to be context specific. For example, the indicator of child sex ratio or sex ratio at birth has slipped through the sieves of targets and indicators. Hmm. Uh, the third reason is that, as Sophie mentioned, there's a deficit in capacities in evolving gender indicators, data, you know, identifying data, monitoring, uh, taking corrective measures and raising resources. Here I want to say in monitoring, there's a lot of monitoring of where we are now, but what has been the trend? What have been the past policy and legal measures and why in spite of them, it has not been achieved? So what is it that we need to do differently? That is the kind of monitoring which is required uh, to re and not more of the same thing when it has not yielded result. For example, I just want to say in India, we have a lot of uh, laws against uh, legislation on violence against women, but violence against women is high. We have legislation in um, many countries on property rights of women, but still they own maybe 10 or 12 percent of agricultural land. So we need to look at what is not working and how to rectify. Yeah. Um, and the capacity deficit uh, is really, if we look globally, hmm, it is high. If you look at the global gender gap, it is high in economic, political uh, area. And I would say also in issues like climate change, peace, violence. Yeah. Um, and I would also like to distinguish while health, the global gender gap looks good. If you look at controversial issues like access to safe abortion, that is not available. So we need to look at even in the so-called health education where more progress has been made. Is it in controversial or non-controversial areas? So this is something which we need to look at. Then I would like to say that there is a capacity deficit at all levels, um, be it international, because we still, our indicators are weak on six SDGs, 
yeah and uh, it is also at the national level india for example while sdg 1 talks about poverty indicators if you come uh, sex disaggregated poverty indicators if you come to the national one there is no mention of sex disaggregated poverty indicators so it has just slipped through the sieve yeah so we need to look at uh, where what kind of capacity is required interstate national states corporates push sdg commitment and targets out of them not targets but how they are going to contribute to which sdg at the community level family level we need to work with local government there is a capacity deficit there we are talking about devolution but not building their capacity around sdgs and gender and we need context specific training like i said patriarchy is very high in south asia so we need to look at that we need you know nutrition malnutrition is high in sub saharan africa in south asia a lot how do we look at substantive gender equality and anemia you know women's anemia rates are so high that if it is plugged into uh, uh, SDG 1 on poverty, um, it will address gender and poverty uh, malnutrition issues. Uh, so these are some of the kind of uh, uh, challenges which we have and we need to renegotiate um, even on multidimensional poverty index to include not only child nutrition, but anemia and such things. So we need to build capacity, um, you know, even globally and nationally, community level for on uh, gender equality and SDGs. Next, please. Next, yeah. I want to talk about a few good practices. One is from Nepal. Um, you know, where the State Planning Commission and civil society actors were brought together by UNDP to develop indi national indicators and develop capacity on gender equality and SDGs. And the indicators are phenomenal. They are very, they're very inclusive. They disaggregate by gender, by caste, by region, and both together. So I thought that at the time of framing national indicators, if capacities can be built. In um, some countries are still at a draft stage on um, developing national indicators. And if this opportunity could be used, it would be fantastic. And whatever be the gender training, I think we need to push SDGs. For example, in Sri Lanka, there was a training to gender mainstream in universities. So there I pushed what was SDGs with regard to tertiary education and use that as a platform for discussion. So grab every opportunity. And third, I want to talk is about India, where there was a, a monitoring, uh, bringing together different stakeholders on um, health, uh, SDG three. So we also looked at gender within that. We looked at abortion, we looked at uh, um, anemia and poverty linked to anemia, violence and health. So how do we, you know, weave gender equality and look at interlinkages between the SDGs? And um, so it's very important that even if it, if the capacity building is around one SDG, we weave the interlinkages like what Sophie had also talked about. The other is, I want, lastly, I want to say about Vistar. We have been running Mercy and Me. She's the director of Vistar. I was the, I'm the former board member. We've been running international course, which brings government, NGOs, civil society actors, students together. We do introduce about concepts on substantive gender equality. Then we cover SDGs, the strengths and weaknesses and the history, MDGs, development debates, etc. And then we go into uh, their reflection on the targets and indicators and uh, how it can be monitored historically from MDG time to now and what is required and how using participatory, gender sensitive participatory approaches, we could monitor at local government level, community level. So 
uh, there is all you know so this is a, 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 a platform which we use and we have developed a manual around this um, and I want to say that there have also been measures like using SDG gender index equal measures they have developed which could be strengthened which is an index across many of the goals it includes indicators across many goals and they measure progress so that could be used so ultimately i just want to say that next please last last yeah i feel that uh, there is a convergence with which is required between people who are working on substantive gender equality and training on development and SDG processes. We need to dialogue with each other and, uh, you know, uh, converge. And then only it is possible to see a world where the marginalized women achieve equality with men from their own community and also with men and women from privileged backgrounds like me yeah so we want to see a better world and a sustainable world um, and the substantive gender equality is about that and unless we work together and institutionalize such a perspective within international training institutions, national, state, provincial level, and for the local government, then only a change is possible. So together we can make a change if we build capacities around gender equalities and SDGs. Thank you. Very much, Vanjani. That was a wonderful way and your excellent presentation. And uh, I think we've all learned a lot from you and we're very excited as well to, to continue with uh, with Dr. Ellen Morris, who's our third speaker today. And I think she'll pick up on what Ranjani and uh, Sophie were both speaking about. And uh, I'll just introduce Ellen. And uh, I should note that Dr. Ellen Morris is an expert on energy and international development. She teaches at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, and she's a faculty affiliate at the Center on Global Energy Policy. She's also the program lead on university partnerships at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and is the president and founder of Sustainable Energy Solutions, which promotes the use of clean energy to support development and reduce poverty in developing countries. So Ellen, over to you. Uh, I'd like to, to ask you to please begin. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. And thanks for having me at this important event. I really uh, am pleased to be a part of it. Uh, I'm going to start with this uh, woman on the young woman on the on the first slide. And when we think about this young woman, we, we want to think about a way and a world to create opportunities for women like her, uh, young women throughout the value chain. And what we mean by creating uh, women uh, as leaders and women uh, in the workforce is women in policy making positions, working in energy ministries, women working in senior management and leadership within the private and public sector, pioneers pushing new business development, um, <clears throat> working as valued members of the workforce within utilities or electricity generation, and entrepreneurs disseminating off-grid renewable energy solutions, and of course the customers who benefit from access to energy. So we want to think forward, and I think the, the, the goals and aims of this webinar are important uh, at what are the tools and training necessary to make a different world um, to help this young woman move from uh, very laborious and manual labor into more productive and uh, higher income earning uh, jobs. Next slide. When you think of energy access and the role that women play in, in uh, the energy value chain, we like to think of um, uh, you know, women and men as, as benefiting and as contributing uh, equally into the energy sector. However, women typically are the hands and feet of the energy sector. And what I mean by that is uh, the ferrying of goods, water and children, which is uh, very, uh, can be very heavy and arduous work. It means uh, carrying and collecting wood fuel. It means getting to market and selling market goods. It means uh, preparing the household, uh, both economically and, um, and managing childcare. 
And it also obviously means a lot of manual labor. And these photographs illustrate what we think of uh, as women really being that backbone of the energy sector as it is now. And what we're trying to do is shift um, to a more uh, uh, a more widely um, equitable world and one in which um, the energy sector can be a way to to move into that. Next slide. With the sustainable element, sustainable development goals, we're really at a breakthrough moment with gender and energy issues recognized for their importance at the global and the grassroots level. There is now momentum building for a movement that highlights the need for a rights-based approach to energy access for women and marginalized people who we just saw in the previous slide. In seeking to achieve the interlinked goals of the Istanbul Program for Action, Sustainable Energy for All, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the Climate Paris Agreement, and reach the poorest and most marginalized people, new and innovative approaches are needed to energy for energy service delivery. And there are training and education opportunities all along that way. Women, men, and marginalized people need to be involved in the planning, designing, and executing of creative approaches to maximize benefits for all. This will require tailored solutions for different regions, demographics, and challenges, all with the common themes of empowerment and equality and the role of training and education, and as it relates to the energy sector, specifically in the field of technical uh, and management positions. Next slide. I wanted to just briefly present an example of uh, gender and geothermal. And geothermal energy um, is obviously a very male-dominated field, similar to a lot of extractive industries like oil and gas and mining. And this is work that is was led by the World Bank Energy Sector Management Assistance Program with their Global Geothermal Development Program. And in that very innovative look and progressive uh, work that the World Bank is doing, they decided to work a lot on the gender roles in infrastructure development and energy infrastructure development, and more specifically to look at geothermal, which has uh, never been done before. So we are in the process of rolling this out with their geothermal projects around the world. And I just wanted to highlight a few things that came out of the research we did on the geothermal sector and the engagement of training and uh, capacity building for local communities and the uh, workforce. So as I said, women are not well represented as is not unexpected. Geothermal projects employ mainly men for both skilled and unskilled jobs at the work site. Although women comprise 40% of the workforce globally, women account for as low as 8% of the workforce in construction, which is a very big part of geothermal development, and 12% in the industry as a whole. Um, we need to really um, think about <clears throat> how to uh, attack this problem differently. And we see a lot of gender stereotyping that goes on in science, technology, engineering, and math uh, education. And the existence of relatively fewer female candidates from this so-called STEM education backgrounds applying for scientific and engineering positions is very common in the geothermal field as it is in other extractive industries. There is also an unintentional employer bias that you see and the tendency of men to recruit from within their own male dominated networks in the case where males are often overrepresented. So it's not only the education in science, technology, engineering, and math, but it's also in building those networks uh, and the employment selections being made in a balanced way. In addition, the lower prevalence of female STEM graduates does not explain necessarily the lack of women working in unskilled or vocational jobs. At a geothermal site, there is a lot of unskilled labor, which is predominantly men as well. In the U.S., it's been noted that there's been a general decrease over the past 20 to 30 years in women working in lower level technical positions, a change attributed to declines in available community colleges, vocational schools, and apprenticeships. When local hiring at a geothermal project site in a, in a developing country, for example, gender biases are very common. 
By default, project companies may look to hire local men without fully seeking to understand women's capabilities and their interest in, in obtaining employment. So just by not necessarily asking the right questions of the right people, the work site still remains very male dominated. Another major element of a geothermal project site is the importance of the lack of a, of a safe environment for women. And if they're typically in a very um, high infrastructure, very uh, uh, intense, uh, you know, lots of heavy equipment, the lack of a safe work environment for women deters both skilled and unskilled workers in the field and in the office and creates an image problem deterring new hires to enter the field. In addition, the fact that there is a lot of harassment, discrimination, gender-based violence, lack of sanitary facilities and living quarters, ill-fitting and culturally inappropriate protective devices makes the geothermal sector particularly unattractive for women. Even when women's workwear is available, companies still need to be convinced that it's a good investment. Next slide. In thinking about geothermal, <clears throat> the reality is that gender is usually an afterthought rather than part of the design process or the implementation process. And obviously, the ideal time to integrate gender considerations is early on in the project cycle. Benefits are seen widely, not only in the geothermal sector, but in the energy industry as a whole and the wider workforce, that there are benefits from a gender balanced team, better decision making, higher worker, <coughs> higher worker satisfaction, et cetera. In addition, a geothermal project by nature of how it works in terms of creating electricity, water, roads, IT infrastructure, there's a lot of co-benefits that a geothermal project can have affecting both men and women in terms of economic development, jobs creation, and environmental preservation. So the upsides of a geothermal project, which includes both women and men, is that there's wide community support because of the, uh, the co-benefits of geothermal development happening there. The upside also is uh, mitigating risk associated with the project as the more progressive and uh, uh, clear environmental guidelines, environmental risks and management, uh, environmental risks can be managed appropriately. In addition, the upside is the balanced allocation of the workforce and employment, creating training and education opportunities, but also the link to jobs creation. Next slide. So this is a quick overview of the geothermal project <coughs> cycle, which can be anywhere from uh, 10 to 20 years, from the time the initial resource is identified to the far left, to the decommissioning of the project. So it produces very uh, significant amounts of baseload power. They can be in very remote settings and they have very high reliability and very uh, good track record. However, as I just mentioned, women are not well represented in the geothermal sector on the whole, in developing countries and in developed countries. However, with appropriate training, and education, links to jobs um, via uh, either in the project development or in the collateral benefits from the geothermal power, as well as leadership and management, moving from that entry level position, creating a workforce that allows women to move up and uh, manage projects. And <clears throat> specifically, training more women in technical fields is one of the early steps of helping enable them to enter the geothermal sector in positions tr traditionally dominated by men. And helping women remain in those positions can entail a constellation of other factors, including, as was mentioned in previous presentations, providing childcare, adjusting work and travel schedules when necessary, providing a workforce that is free from harassment, discrimination, and violence, 
ensuring the existence of viable career mobility pathways, and eliminating the gender pay gap, among many other things. Secondly, training opportunities also exist, or perhaps originate, within companies and span subjects that are not just technical in nature. We think of geothermal as very much engineering and science focused. However, the corporate question of who is eligible for and receives training must be addressed in a systematic way that takes gender into account. Male supervisors can unconsciously recommend male reports more frequently. And some training or mentoring relationships that were traditionally one-on-one, -on -one, either at the power plant, the geothermal power plant, or in the management C-suite, could be more thoughtfully and formally structured into mixed gender groups that include women and men that will likely lead to better decision-making processes. Some women working in the geothermal sector don't require technical training so much as advanced leadership training, greater exposure to large companies, and access to a vibrant, perhaps international network of similarly minded professionals. And then finally, coupled with training, employment targets can be another way to increase the number of opportunities to women working in the geothermal workforce. For example, the project design of the Menengai Geothermal Project in Kenya that is operated by the Geothermal Development Company, owned by the government of Kenya, had a target of 30% women in different staff functions, including drilling, geosciences, and the business unit. And this has been an important example and key to supporting gender integration in the implementation of the project and resulted in the Geothermal Development Company of Kenya having its first ever female drilling engineer and serving as an example for other geothermal companies as to how this can be done, how it leads to a uh, better bottom line result. So um, in, in summary, and finally, I just wanna throw this out there to the audience. Next slide. is thinking about the role uh, that you play in this ecosystem. And from my perspective, I focus on energy and the energy sector. And so I'm thinking about what those career paths look like and thinking about my role as a university professor. A lot of the folks I've talked to are in graduate school or undergraduate school studying engineering, but it's also thinking about other aspects of the energy sector the vocational training, the apprenticeships, the larger goal of unskilled and skilled labor, I think needs to be prominently out there and uh, thinking about how to make that more appealing to women and girls as a viable career path. And then where are those entry points? And again, this is an important aspect about thinking about the companies themselves thinking about the development partners, how they mindfully address what these entry points are and making sure that gender is adequately considered at that project design phase, the investment size, the investment stage, the operations, and many other entry points that you might find yourself in. And then thinking about the skill sets um, that you have and leveraging those skill sets into a really uh, high, uh, a very um, uh, important um, career path because a lot of the, what you see at least in the energy sector and in, in a lot of sort of technical sectors is there's a high entry into the sector, but that retention along the career path becomes more of a burden. And that has to do with things that were mentioned that I mentioned earlier around childcare, around flexibility, around um, uh, you know, making these opportunities uh, amenable to and flexible enough that women can still remain in the workforce as they start to have a family and that sort of thing. So, so I'm uh, looking forward to your questions on that and thank you very much for having me on this. Thank you very much, Ellen. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise today. And I think your presentation was excellent. As our, And uh, we'll just go on with our final presentation for today, um, which is by Dr. Sue Cavill. So I'm very happy to be welcoming her as well with us. 
today and uh, let me just introduce her. Sue is an international expert who specializes in gender, water, sanitation and hygiene uh, in developing countries and for nearly two decades she's focused on strategy development, policy relevant research, analysis and dissemination, monitoring and evaluation, funding proposals, technical support for WASH programming and capacity building, education and training. So I'm very very happy to have you here uh, Sue and I think in I'm just going to send you a request to unmute. Yeah. OK, great. So over to you, Sue. Thank you very much. Well, thanks ever so much. And thank you for the invitation to join you today for this um, event. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So um, I wanted to um, talk today about um, gender equality training in relation to water sanitation and hygiene. Um, we call it WASH. Um, so as Sophie mentioned in her presentation, the wording of the Sustainable Development Goal 6 and the target it has on universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water does not specifically refer to gender. Um, and Sophie mentioned some of the gendered outcomes of lack of access to safe drinking water. Next slide, please. But, um, but within the goal, there's um, a target um, 6.2 on sanitation and hygiene. And this does specifically refer to um, attention to the needs of women and girls in relation to sanitation and hygiene. Um, and as the SDG goals and targets on education and maternal and neonatal health recognize, and that special attention to water sanitation and hygiene for women is needed across their life course for example by helping girls to manage their menstruation in schools and also supporting maternal and neonatal health in clinics um, and this is recognized in the SDG goals and targets and in this way WASH can help play a role in reducing gender inequalities in different areas of focus under the SDGs. Now as Ellen said with energy WASH is another uh, male dominated sector and a number of WASH implementation agencies, women only make up around 30% of the workforce. And within um, the workforce, there is some gender stereotyping of roles that women play. For instance, women might be more likely to work um, in technical areas related to sanitation and hygiene, or they might be um, more likely to work on policy issues or communication. And this is for some of the reasons that Ellen's also outlined in her presentation. Um, within the WASH sector, we make a number of claims around the benefits of improved water sanitation and hygiene for women and girls, um, but very few organisations have a specific gender policy or pay deliberate attention to women and girls um, across all stages of WASH programming and service delivery. So for us, training is very important, firstly, so that we can aim to achieve gender parity in the WASH sector, so that we have equal numbers of men and women working across all technical areas in the sector. But we also need capacity as WASH professionals to understand gender equality um, in relation to water sanitation and hygiene, and to understand what our responsibilities are in relation to this. So, um, so gender equality or training for gender equality has been a long-standing concern in our sector um, and over the last few decades training efforts by centres such as WEDEC in the UK have targeted engineers and technicians and project managers to build capacity in the sector to respond to gender issues um, and they do this by increasing awareness of um, professionals on the gender specific WASH needs and um, the different needs of men, women, boys and girls um, and they also aim to increase staff knowledge on what gender equality looks like in the context of a WASH programme and help hopefully aim to equip staff with the skills to design programmes um, and also run participatory exercises with communities that focus on, on um, achieving gender equality between men, women, girls and boys in the communities we work for. But in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, we as WASH professionals need to know more about how to respond to intersectionalities with gender. So we need to think about um, gender in relation to race, ethnicity, age and sexuality. And for instance, we need to know something more about how we, how we help design facilities or respond to the needs of trans women using public facilities. So that as WASH professionals, we have the capacity, but also importantly, the confidence to respond. So like Ranjani said, we can achieve gender equality for all women. Um, and as, as WASH professionals, we, um, we have 
um, quite specific expertise and experience so we need to know how to work with others better and training on gender equality can also help us to be better partners with those who have specific expertise in this area so for instance women's groups can help us um, improve our programming and also respond better to the challenges we face and in this way um, training can help us become more effective in achieving our joint outcomes by giving us the tools and the language to work effectively with others. And I think this is something like the convergence that Ranjani also mentioned in her presentation. So next slide, please. Um, in, in terms of WASH programmes, as WASH professionals, we're quite confident and quite used to thinking about gender in terms of having um, equal numbers of women and men on community WASH committees to support the maintenance and the operation of WASH facilities in the communities that we work with. Um, but as a sector, we have tended to stereotype men and women um, and, and we can um, be guilty of reinforcing um, traditional um, gender norms within communities by reinforcing, for example, the role of women in collecting water for their houses or taking care of their children's toileting needs. Um, we've got less experience of engaging men around sanitation and hygiene or water issues within the household in particular so that men and boys can share wash responsibilities in the household and also be positive community role models on water sanitation and hygiene. So we need to know how to better influence the attitudes of more boys and men and also how we can work towards equalising relationships um, between men um, and also between women and men. Um, and we can do this by supporting campaigns that create a conversation about traditional gender roles and how we can challenge some of the harmful gender stereotypes that might exist. So training can help us, um, training on gender equality can help us support the scaling of some of the more gender transformative approaches that we've seen in the sector, in the WASH sector in recent years. So for example, by promoting dialogue between women and men, in the household and in their communities on the role and responsibilities for water sanitation and hygiene they have um, with the aim of redistributing workloads at the household level. Um, and training can also help us ensure that wash facilities are designed and constructed but also managed in ways that support gender equality um, and and this could um, help WASH staff become more confident and comfortable in dealing with gender specific issues that relate to water sanitation and hygiene, for instance, around violence um, and also um, menstrual hygiene. So that we can take this awareness and this increased capacity to help design policy and programmes um, and advocate for budgets to implement um, programmes that support this. But training is also um, it needs to be accompanied by the space for reflection so that um, so that we can support WASH professionals to develop um, the capacity but also to reflect for themselves on these issues and to think about um, how they can how they can address their own um, perceptions and attitudes and beliefs um, as well as in their role as professionals working in the sector to design policies and programs. And in this way, we can support staff capacity to take account of gender issues that are more transformative um, and, and better informed. Next slide, please. So in terms of monitoring um, and evaluating WASH services, um, the, the WHO UNICEF Joint Monitoring Programme is the custodian of WASH sector monitoring on SDG 6. Um, and this includes attention to monitoring at the household level, but also in institutions like schools and health facilities. And in the past, the, the Joint Monitoring Programme has reported on gender in terms of gender differences in, in the collection of water and the time and the burden that this takes, and also the responsibility for child faeces management at the household level. And more recently, the JMP, the Joint Monitoring Programme, has reported on access to separate toilets for girls in schools and for women in health facilities, as well as um, ac their access to facilities that support um, them to manage menstruation in these settings. Um, recently, the, um, the multiple indicator cluster surveys, which are the major source of national data for monitoring SDG targets on, um, on water, sanitation and hygiene, um, that these these um, piloted these and um, the JMP piloted um, a study in Belize um, 
based on collecting information on menstrual hygiene in the, in the mix, in the multiple indicator cluster survey. Um, and it found that um, this was a useful way to understand what's happening at the household level on menstrual hygiene. Um, so this is an important um, advance in our understanding of monitoring data related, specifically gender related. Um, NGOs like um, Plan International have also identified and developed specific tools to help um, understand changes in gender relations at the household um, and community level in relation to WASH. Um, in, in the past, we've typically collected disaggregated data um, in our baseline surveys as well as in our research and evaluations. But um, it, as WASH professionals, we tend to have less capacity to identify changes in gender relations at the individual and the household level, for instance, by monitoring changes in men's attitudes and behaviours and practices regarding roles of responsibilities for WASH, or measuring women and girls' feelings of safety and using sanitation facilities, or the girls' um, feelings of self-efficacy to manage menstruation in schools. So um, gender um, equality training can also help us um, develop more capacity to monitor on these issues, as well as to develop indicators and refine tools to make sure that we can better capture different gendered outcomes through our WASH programmes. Um, and we also need to think about the way that we monitor and evaluate as WASH professionals so that we have um, increased capacity to help ensure that um, the activities are carried out by teams, um, how the balance of the teams responds to um, appropriate gender equality and also team members have the, the capacity and the confidence they need to do this well. Next slide please. So um, just to wrap up, um, the WASH sector needs, um, needs to work in partnership and, and also needs more training um, to support accountability for progress on Sustainable Development Goal 6. For, through the Sanitation Waterfall initiative, we've got a platform and a shared vision of how we progress in terms of the sector building blocks um, and the collaborative behaviours that we hope to see um, in the sector. Um, but there's also a role for training and education um, in domesticating and implementing these priorities and behaviours, as well as understanding technical issues around how to develop um, sustainable um, sector financing strategies and um, how we can support um, government leadership in sector planning processes. So within the WASH sector, within organisations and government, we can see a number of women in senior leadership roles within the sector. Um, and there is a role for more for training, as Ellen mentioned, in terms of the energy and supporting women to take on these, these roles in our sector. We've also got experience of women's rights organisations like Jagori, and they've built um, coalitions and alliances with WASH organisations. For instance, they've done this in India to improve urban services and to hold authorities to account for improving public services like public toilets in cities and making sure that women feel safe um, to use them. And we've got examples of how advocacy has been used um, for increasing attention and commitment on issues such as menstrual hygiene and um, arguing that the menstrual hygiene should be included in national plans to support um, um, a better accountability for um, making sure that women and girls can manage menstruation outside the home. But in the, uh, an institutional level, there's also a need for more training to support um, women's leadership, as I mentioned, as well as gender equality in terms of our policies and decision makings. And, and this would help create an enabling environment for the implementation of Sustainable Development Goal 6 and its related outcomes. So um, that's all I want to say. And then thank you very much for your attention and look forward to any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. That was a wonderful presentation. So we've had four excellent presentations and I think we've learned a great deal from them. And uh, you've all been sending in your questions as we've gone on. And uh, I've put, I've uh, taken note of a lot of them. I don't know how many we'll be able to get through right now because uh, we're running a little bit over time, but I'm just going to switch over to my screen so we can see um, the questions. Okay, so we've got our questions here. Here are some of the questions that we have been seeing, we've been receiving from all of you. And uh, maybe I think because Sophie, you 
uh, mentioned that you won't be able to stay very long. So I thought perhaps we could start uh, with you and maybe Ranjani for the first question, which is how could we convince the public and private sector of the need to train data collectors to set gender responsive indicators for SDG monitoring? And Sophie, maybe do you want to reply first and then Ranjani can come in? Oh, am I off mute now? Yes, you're off mute. <laughs> All right, hi. Um, I actually, I'm really sorry. I actually really do have to go now. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Um, is, <laughs> is it possible to, um, to receive some questions afterwards yes. and follow up in some other way? Yes, um, completely. I'll yeah. be in touch and I'll give you the link to the forum discussion where you can reply to some of these questions. Wonderful. Thank I'd you. be really happy to follow up with anybody. Um, thank, thank you so much for having me today and thank you to the other panellists and um, everybody that's in the audience and for um, for you both for organising this. Thank I you very much. I hope you be in touch. Great. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, Ranjani, maybe if you want to take this question. Uh, I just want to say that uh, uh, thanks, Ruya, firstly, and thanks, uh, Farhana. I just want to say, firstly, that the government needs to be uh, convinced with regard to controversial gender responsive indicators. So that is the first challenge. And then training the collectors of data uh, when new sets of data is required. Yeah, so there are two challenges. Um, and I think uh, there are independent institutes which do train data collectors who do, for example, the National Family Health Survey or uh, what you call demographic health survey to just give an example. So it is possible to train uh, the people who do the survey. And uh, I think some sensitive issues you cannot ask directly. It has to be asked indirectly. So I want, just want to say that first convince the government and then the um, you know, uh, people who collect the data and it is possible. And we also need to look at gender composition of the data collectors. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Randani. Um, and I think maybe Ellen, because there is a question that was asked directly for you um, about entry points for gender and energy conversations at the macro policy and technical level. Yeah, I just wanted to also just briefly add a, one point on the data, uh, just because the what we found in our work on gender and energy is that the data collection is very anecdotal at this point about uh, how energy is being used by women and men who the purchasing of energy systems, all of those kinds of data are, are difficult um, to find. And I think with more transparency and more standard metrics as it relates specifically to my field, which is energy and probably relates to the water and sanitation as well, because it's a bit similar, but trying to really standardize how data is collected and then incorporating that data into the planning process, whether that's uh, you know, environmental and social impact assessments before a project is developed or whether it's on policy creation and creating that kind of uh, substantive evidence for a particular policy or a program. So that's one thing on data. And in the policy, um, the entry points for gender and energy conversations, what I've found in my work is specific to some recent work we did in economic community of West African states in West Africa. So the 15 countries that are members there, they have the first ever uh, policy on gender mainstreaming for energy access. So that is a very unique and forward looking policy about how to look at uh, gender entry points at a range of levels. And what was the important success um, for that was the intersection of the gender ministries with the energy ministries. And so that created a, a space for those two different, uh, very, uh, uh, with different mandates to basically have a discussion and a dialogue about how to move forward a gender inclusive uh, energy sector. So I think it's about, um, uh, first of all, having the right people around the table that want to work together 
and then those entry points at the macro level uh, really open up. And so with the development of that policy, it was done in, in record time, in, in a year's time, by the ECOWAS Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, and with the leadership and champion at the top, as well as in each of the ministries, that entry point um, became very clear and very open. And at the technical level, the entry points, as I said, have to happen before uh, someone gets to university. It has to happen all along with young children, young girls, uh, high school students, and then university students really thinking about the stigma associated with studying in a technical field or in a professional field that is probably not very well represented with women in the field. So I think it's uh, creating that um, uh, link to the young people and the creating that workforce from the ground up, but then also making sure that, that there are career paths open for those young women and that those barriers are removed. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ellen. And mm -hmm. I think drawing on what you just said about, um, you know, getting having to go through the entire life cycle. I wonder, Sue, if you'd like to address one of the last questions that we received, just because we're, we're a bit tight on time, um, about uh, how what kind of strategies and approaches maybe you've used in the wash sector to change the mindsets of different groups, as you spoke about men and women and also children and students? Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, in the in the wash sector, um, the if you think about the school environment and um, maybe thinking about uh, menstrual hygiene management, for for instance, there are um, and many schools have a school club that focuses on health and hygiene issues, um, and within that. Um, there, there's usually some discussion around uh, hygiene issues and specifically more recently um, organizations like Water Aid or Plan International have been talking about menstrual hygiene and perhaps this set is done separately with boys and girls or maybe it's done together in classes um, but um, thinking about how you can talk about this issue so that people feel comfortable um, and can um, and hopefully boys can support um, their, their friends who are menstruating um, to, to manage that in schools. Um, so I think um, I think there's a number of ways that uh, we can aim to transform gender relationships more broadly um, through taking WASH as an entry point. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sue. Well, I'm afraid that we've run out of time, really, to go through any more of your questions. But as I mentioned to Sophie, we are going to be posting all these questions on our COP discussion forum. And I will ask our speakers if they have time to go to the discussion forum and reply to these questions or maybe by email. And uh, I think that we should really continue the debates because all of you have, have shed so much light on how training for gender equality really is an integral part of achieving the SDGs. And uh, so I'd encourage all of you to go to the UN Women Training Center's website, uh, which you can see on your screens. You access the COP and uh, log into the portal this way. And if you aren't a COP member, you can uh, join at any time. It's completely free. And if you have any questions or any trouble, you can email me at ria.lagari at unwomen.org or access our general email <laughs> account and, uh, and become a member of the COP and continue the discussions. So this um, webinar has been recorded and it'll be available on our YouTube channel. And uh, so you can share the link with uh, your networks and we'll also be circulating a final report on the virtual dialogue and the webinar um, later this month. So I'd like to thank you all again, Sophie, Ranjani, Ellen and Sue for your excellent presentations. Thank you to all our audience members for your wonderful questions. And I'm sorry we couldn't get through so many of them, but uh, we'll, I hope we'll continue the debates on the COP platform discussion forum and uh, get more uh, debates and dialogue out of it. So thank you all very much and we wish you all a very pleasant day. Thank you.